Britain is a country that owes a great deal to its rail empire. For a hundred years, the railways dominated the development of this country, the network that supported a global superpower. But today, our island is home to 10,000 miles of disused lines, a silent network of embankments, platforms and viaducts. For me and many others, they've become a perfect platform for exploring the country on foot. This week I've come to Wales, to the market town of Dalgethai to be precise, and there in the distance are the southern hills of Snowdonia National Park. Northern Wales tends to conjure up images of mountain scenery, rivers and lakes, which of course are all major tourist attractions. But the railway walk I'm taking today follows a line that was actually built to bring those tourists here in the first place. It promises a surprising history and beautiful scenery, and yet this is one of the quieter corners of Snowdonia. And the railway walk apparently is the only way to fully appreciate it. And of course, I want to find out why. From Dolgetlai, my walk today follows the line that once reached out from the West Midlands all the way to the Welsh West Coast. It was one of numerous lines that ran across Wales by the end of the 19th century, connecting these remote parts with Birmingham, Manchester and beyond. But in the beaching era of the 1960s, the majority of these routes were deemed surplus to requirements and disappeared from the map. I'm going to head downstream for a few minutes and find the old railway track bed, but you can see that ancient road bridge. In fact, on the other side of that ancient road bridge is where the railway station used to be. Nothing at all left now. The cars and lorries of the Dolgethlai bypass now rush past where the railway once stood. But in 1867, this was where two railway empires met head on. The race to control a route to the Welsh coast saw the English Great Western Railway build a line through Wales as far as here. But it was the much smaller Cambrian Railway Company that built the line inland from the coast, the section that I'll be walking today. Before I set off, let's take a closer look at the route. I'll head west, out of Dolgetlai, following the river and the bypass, towards the head of the Mouthak estuary. From here, the old railway makes its own path, across the reed bed and floodplains, to meet the River Mouthak at Penmine Pool Bridge. Now the river really begins to look like an estuary. The railway path hugs the south bank as it follows the corridor through the Welsh hills. Before the estuary mouth, I pass through the slate mining community of Arthog, where tramways once crossed the line, taking the slate down to the waterside. And then there's a long curve as trains once reached the bustling Barmouth Junction, the final landmark before the stunning approach to Barmouth itself. Barmouth Bridge may be man-made, but what finer way could there be to reach the Welsh West Coast? I've learned since I've been in Dogletho. One is that the history of Welsh railways is slightly complex, and the other one is that the pronunciation of Dogletho or Doglethi is a bit of a mystery wrapped in a riddle. So I'm going to meet someone who's going to clear it up for me. And she's from Lancashire. Right, 
When she's not preoccupied with her bed and breakfast business overlooking the Malthac, Jackie O'Hanlon leads walking and bike tours of the estuary. And of course, all of them make use of Dolgethlai's old railway line. So Jackie, Dolgethi? Dolgethi. And I don't know why I'm asking you from Lancashire, <laughs> but you've been here for a while now, so you've heard all, all different pronunciations. Yes, it's either Dolgethlai, when you ask people how it's pronounced, that's the very Welsh way, yep. or Dolgethli is also right. And people will mix between the two, just when you think you've got it. They'll use the other one just to make it. Right, so there is no right or wrong, really. There's a definite wrong if you go Dolagaloo. <laughs> Dolagaloo, yes, good. But there's two rights. What on earth is a woman from Lancashire doing here? <laughs> well, we'd heard about the scenery, the, how beautiful it was, the beautiful biking that's here, the walking that's here. Um, the estuary, to be honest, was a big surprise at how spectacular that was. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful, hidden away, and it's a lovely place to live. And it's nice to share that with people and introduce them to a bit more about the area. Now, here we are in this very picturesque setting, and we're about to cross over, uh, aren't we, actually, to where the railway begins? Yes, this is where we cross the river, and from the other side of the footbridge is where the actual railway track, where the trail joins the actual railway track. You've mentioned Barmouth, and yes. I mean, that was one of the, the big reasons for the railway line, wasn't mm -hmm. it? To, to ship the tourists in, but it wasn't all yes. about tourists. No, no, there was also, uh, Dolgethlai had a very busy um, web trade, lots of weaving, that went out on the railway lines. Also, slate mining along the estuary went out along the railway lines. I think the, a lot of people don't know what, how much there was here, actually, because it's beautiful and tranquil and very quiet, and the idea that once it was full of slate quarries and mining and shipbuilding and weaving and everything else, now there's sheep grazing on the mountains and that's about it. And what should I keep my eyes peeled for along the way? The trail takes the south side of the Malvac estuary. All along the north side you'll see the mountains, that's where all the Welsh gold, Quag Eye mm. Mines, we're up there. Right, might find some. <laughs> you might, you'd need to cross the river to okay. find it. A bit of digging, that's all right. Indeed, <laughs> yes. On your left hand side you'll also see, as well as the remnants of the railway, um, you'll also see a Penman Pool Bridge, which is beautiful, and also there's some tank traps from World War II. Tank traps? Why? During World War II, they suspected that there may be an invasion coming in through the estuary, and they put blockades in the way to keep the tanks back. Tank traps. Tank so traps. they don't sound picturesque and pretty in any way. They're not as bad as you think they might look, actually. Oh. They have a certain something about them, but they're, that's what they are. When you encounter them, you'll know what they are. OK. Jackie's agreed to meet me further down the line to lead me through some of the less well-known landmarks on the estuary. But for now, it's time to cross the River Onion and join the old Cambrian Railway. So this is it. This is where the old track bed used to be. You can't actually make out where it would have come out of Dolgethai there, but you can see, and you can probably hear, the bypass just there. But not for long. The railway origins of my path soon become more obvious. Within half a mile, a distinct embankment appears. Then you're joined by another telltale feature of a railway line. An avenue of trees lining the route as it cuts through the silted up area of the upper estuary. This is now designated as a site of special scientific interest. An important breeding ground for wetland birds and a varied environment of salt marsh, swamp, and perfectly flat grazing grounds. Now, that might look like a field in front of me, but in fact, it is the largest reed bed in Wales, quite boggy underfoot, but follow my finger through to the village there, and that's where the two rivers meet, the River Malthac and the River Union, and then the eye travels into the valley to the right-hand side, and you should be able to smell gold, because that's where a lot of the Welsh gold mining industry took place. The rush for Welsh gold in this area started in the 1860s, the same decade as the railway's arrival. Since then, the industry has grown and shrunk repeatedly, with the most recent activity ending in 1998. The northern side of the Malthac estuary has produced some of the most prized and highly valued gold in the world. And to this day, British royal weddings are usually topped off with a ring made of Welsh gold. I can spy the 
toll bridge at Penmine Pool. There she is. Pretty obvious landmark. <laughs> Since 1879, the wooden bridge has served as a permanent crossing of the estuary, connecting the railway station at Penmine Pool with the north side of the estuary and the gold mining industry. So if it's 60p for a car, what is it for Bradbury? Uh, double. <laughs> one pound twenty. One pound twenty. That's still a bargain. Still what is it to walk over? Twenty p to walk. It goes to pay for that. Maintenance. The repairs and the paint. The bridge replaced a ferry service here, but of course it provided one more obstacle to a shipping industry already being overrun by the railway. You don't have to be an expert to notice the signs of a railway station at this point of the walk. Firstly, there's the signal box in the cream and brown colours of the Great Western Railway. Then there's a very familiar looking station building and an immaculately maintained signal. Penmine Pool is a brief snapshot of the past, topped off by the centuries old George Hotel. It's a favourite with locals and somewhere that I'm meeting an unlikely railway double act. Come along, let's uh, have a look at some uh, paintings and have a chat. Keith Davis and Des Thomas have known each other for a number of years now. One's English, one is Welsh. One's an artist and one's a former train driver. But the important thing is Keith's passion for accurately painting the past. How long have you actually been based here as an artist, Keith? About seven years, 2001. Um, through many hours of going through the archives, looking for information on the railway, um, etc. Um, I managed to find Des that worked and lived here, which was fantastic, because to talk to somebody makes it all come to life. So when was this painting? It's 1960, right. dated 1960, with uh, the Foxcote Manor, which is running at Hangothland now, all restored. So Des, how have things, I mean, now, when you, when you look at Keith's painting, when you look at that, that, that picture, um, how real is it to you? How, how much does it bring back to well, you? Well, it's actually like being on it. And I probably was on that train. <laughs> so, um, driver's on this side, the fireman's on the other side. Yeah. And all you, all you had to do was open the regulator and sit down and watch it go. That was it? Yes. Easy? <laughs> look, at the, look at the scenery and enjoy yourself. So, Des, let's talk a little bit about your career. How old were you when you started on the railways? About, <clears throat> about 15. About 15. And what was the first job? Cleaner. Cleaner. You've got to go through the stages, like, you know, Yeah. like every other trade, apprentice upwards, do you become a driver? And how long, do you think, from start to finish, before you became a driver? Oh, I'd say about 12 to 15 years. And what did you feel when you were told for the first time? In fact, where were you when you were told that the railways were going to close? Um, well, we were in the in these sheds there. We, the um, foreman of the shed received letters to say that Dr. Beechin had arrived and he was going to close the line. I'm not very happy. No. That must have been sad and shocking news for of you. Of course it was. When the railways closed, everything else was rapidly closing down. The wool factories, they didn't last very long afterwards. They closed them down. Shop shut. Nothing there, was there? What did you think of uh, Mr. Beeching himself or Dr. Beeching? I'll pass on that. <laughs> <coughs> And can you remember your last day working on the railways? Uh, yes. Uh, we had to take the last little tanky engine, which worked the local train. We had to take that back to McIntyre. And we were hooting the whistles all the way there and back. <laughs> really sad time. Then we had to travel home by bus, and that was the end of us. And what end of the railway. Leaving the pub, you pass the site of old sidings and a handful of buildings that once served the station and the line. Then you pass through a cutting, once blasted through this finger of hillside to create a flat and direct route for the railway. All right, I know they're lambs, and I know it's the time of year, but I've never heard such noisy sheep. 
Stuart, shut up. Of course, it's no surprise when you walk along old railway tracks that the path is excessively long and straight. For over three quarters of a mile, the embankment stretches out across the sands of the estuary. The valley may look wide and unthreatening, but flash floods have been a feature here for centuries. As recently as 1976, one such flood helped the creation of this path today, as it washed away much of the rocky ballast left behind by the railway. But your reward for this straight trudge is a view that you won't find on any other rail line in the country. And there's the first sighting of Barmouth Bridge in the distance, reflecting in the water, just a thin line from here. Must be about four miles away. For much of the rest of the walk, Barmouth Bridge becomes a teasing goal, regularly disappearing from view, then reappearing moments later, just a little bit closer, as the railway hugs the line between the hillside and the estuary. Well, it's nice to get off the track and go off piste for a while. And from here, you get the most magnificent view of Barmouth Bridge proper for the first time. And it really is enormous. It's about half a mile long. Just think, the Victorians didn't even have to get off the train to soak in this view. That rather grand looking building over there is Cadian Hall. And in fact, apparently the whole of the North Bank is littered with big fat houses built by wealthy Victorians. And Cadian Hall itself was a bit of a literary haven. Tennyson, Ruskin, Darwin, even my mate Wordsworth from the Lakelands would come and hang out here for some estuary inspiration. The Mouthak estuary has certainly not been short of promoters in the past. The Great Western Railway advertised the trip to the Welsh coast as one of the most enchanting in the world. And it was Ruskin, certainly no great lover of railways in general, who once expressed the view that the only walk better than the one from Barmouth to Dolgetlai was the walk from Dolgetlai to Barmouth. Without the old railway line here, you wouldn't be able to do this to walk straight through the estuary. You can see it clearly here on both sides. And I love these old telegraph poles. The bits of railway furniture, if you like, left from the good old days. The only bits. Whereas the north side of the estuary was defined by its mining industry, the south side that the railway line hugged was more agricultural, and there's still some stunning farms today. But as you approach Arthog, and as Jackie suggested, this bank hasn't always been a place of peace and tranquility. Aha, now these must be the World War II remains that Jackie was telling me about, because I'm fairly certain that this concrete doesn't date back to Victorian times. I'm also fairly certain, looking at them, that they would have done a very good job at stopping tanks getting past, sturdier than my Greek grandmother. Sorry, I, but... Hmm. As you approach the tiny mining village of Arthog, it's difficult to imagine a place less likely to witness a major invasion. This quiet collection of cottages owes its existence to the slate mining in the area. And from the air, it's impossible not to notice the crater left behind by the local industry. 
Today, it seems as quiet as the rest of the village. But nothing could be quite as sleepy as the remains of Arthog Station. Jackie, hello again. Hello. <laughs> well, it's not much of a station, is it? No, there's not a lot left. I was expecting a bit more, I must yeah, say. Yes, you're standing where the platform would have been. Right. And the trail would have gone along there. Yeah. And this is it. It was all made of wood and there's not a lot survived. Would the station have been built for tourists? No, not here. No, not here. This station was built to support the slate quarrying. You can, the, all along here were slate quarries. You can still see the heaps and the cottages where the quarrymen would have lived. Right. And this station was built to support that, take it out to Barmouth and then beyond. Now, we're quite close to the water here, which, I mean, I know now it floods, and presumably it would have done back in, yes. back in the good old days yes. as well. it would have um, flooded then. There is a story, who knows if it's true, about the station master for this station clinging on during the floods <laughs> to his station until the water subsided and he was able to survive by holding on to his timber-built station. Bar. Yes, which probably washed away parts <laughs> of it. <laughs> Right, we've done Arthog. What else are we going to see up here? We're going to see some uh, more World War II remains. Ah, right, because I've just seen way. the tank traps back there. So yeah. there's more. There's more on this way. What concreteness. Yes, this is the remains, part of the remains of the World War II marine training camp that was here, Camp Iceland, yeah. one of a number of marine training camps in this area. There was one over the hill, Camp Burma, where my grandpa trained in the war. And what were they all training for, the Marines, around here? Reputedly training for the D-Day landings. And your grandpa was one of them? He was, yes. The presence of so much activity here in the 1940s is a surprise to me, and I'm sure to many other visitors to the area. But there was one reason why Marines came to this spot outside Arthog in particular. In 1894, a Cardiff entrepreneur by the name of Solomon Andrews had thought he could turn this waterside spot into a tourist destination to rival Barmer. He came here with grand plans to develop villas and transport facilities. His dream barely got off the ground, but it did leave the Marines with enough facilities to set up their training base. But it didn't take off as a resort? It didn't take off as a resort, no. Why not? I don't know. They had problems with subsidence, um, they had problems with flooding, and it never really came. It was the Marines, now it's the RAF train in this area. Yeah. <laughs> All the time. Do you want to see that? Yeah, let's go look at the houses. So these are the posh bits that Solomon Andrews built? Yes, these are the houses that he built for part of his uh, resort that were then made use of by the Marines training camp. They had all of the first floor with doors adjoining so they could get from one end to the other without having to come outside. Right. And half of the ground floor, um, some of the residents stayed in the ground floors of their houses and the Marines made use of the rest of it. And we can't go in there, obviously, now it's We all can't private. go in there, no, the footpath goes around this way. With Jackie's help, it's time to head back to the railway and the final station en route to the coast. Looks like we're on another railway track. It does. This is a tramway that was put here. Um, Solomon Andrews made use of tramways all in this area for providing the building materials for his holiday resort mm -hmm. and also the idea to use it to bring people in and out. The visitors. The visitors. <laughs> the, the visitors that never came. The visitors that never came. <laughs> this would connect his resort that we've already seen to the railway station that we're going to go and see. All right. One mile short of Barmouth, my old railway path meets with an active railway. In an area that lost so many of its major rail arteries to Dr Beeching's axe, the Welsh coastline was fortunate to survive. And today it does feel eerily quiet. Yeah. <laughs> this used to be a platform of what was then Barmouth Junction Station. Yeah. Um, it was a very busy station in its day. Yeah. The lines between Dolgeclai and the Cambrian coast on our right and the Cambrian coastlines over to our left, siding here. So it was big, it was a big junction. It was a big junction, yes, it had five platforms. So the only ones in Wales that were bigger were Swansea and Cardiff. And what's it called now? Because it's not Barmouth Junction anymore. Now it's called Morva Malvac. Say that again. Morva Malvac. Morva Malvac. So Jackie, this is where we part ways. I'm heading there. Yes, enjoy your walk over the Barmouth Viaduct. I will, thank you very much. Thank you for okay. all You're your information. Welcome. No problem. I've okay. lived and learned today. Okay. <laughs> enjoy your walk. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Mm. 
here's another tramway, but to be honest, by now all of your attention is just focused straight up ahead on Barmouth and the bridge. And so to the last bit of my walk, which is shared with the quiet but definitely still active coastal line. Opened in 1867, this viaduct, known simply as Barmouth Bridge, is the longest in Wales. It was one of the final and most complex pieces of the link connecting England and the Welsh coast at Barmouth. It was high-tech too, featuring a sliding section at the northerly end that would allow ships to pass through. At 2,292 feet long, the bridge is made up of 113 timber spans and an eight-span iron section. Each iron column had to be sunk 120 feet below sea level through layers of silt and mud to find the rock floor below. So here I am, smack bang in the middle of the Malfag estuary with a view that carries you all the way back to Dolgethai. But I might not have been here at all because if you look back through the newspaper archives, you'll know that in 1980 this bridge was actually closed. It was riddled, infested with shipworm. Now luckily it was treatable with worm-proof glass reinforced cement. Try saying that after a pint at the end of a long walk. Shipworm. The original sliding metal gate mechanism may have been immune to ship's worm, but it took 37 minutes to open and close, so it wasn't a massive success. A hundred years ago, it was replaced with this more conventional swing bridge. But even this hasn't swung open now for over 20 years. So with Barmouth ahead, this is it. The end of the line that once brought fashionable people from England all the way to the Welsh West Coast. And as I've seen today, those visitors of the late 19th century are just one of many developments that this stretch of water has witnessed in recent centuries. It's quite funny that here we are in the most Welsh part of Wales, the national language is commonly spoken, and yet this town is known by the frightfully English name of Barmouth, when it's got a perfectly good Welsh name of Abermau. Just goes to show that those Victorian railway tourists have certainly left their mark, haven't they? Despite the railway and the mining and the quarrying and the shipping and all the millions of visitors to Snowdonia every year, Today, I found a little stretch of water here in Wales. I think it's one of their better-kept secrets. Till now.